understand by habits a habit is a tendency towards an act that has become a repeated performance relatively fixed consistent and easy to perform by an individual if we am if i'm trying to classify the habits the habits can be useful habits that is it can be useful for normal function like respiration breathing etc or it could be harmful habits that has deleterious effect on the teeth and the supporting tissues Now the first habit is the thumb sucking habit it can be defined as the placement of a thumb sometimes one or more fingers in varying depth in the mouth now how do we diagnose this case we diagnose it based on the presence of clean nails and callus on the finger and of course intraoral examination now the sequence of the habit basically depends upon uh, the intensity frequency and the duration of the habit what we generally see in a patient with a thumb sucking habit is label tipping of the maxillary incisors increased overjet anterior open bite a narrow dental large because the tongue is now positioned anteriorly and it does not give enough pressure to the buccinator muscle so buccinator muscle activity is more the patient may also develop tongue thrusting habit because of the open bite which is being caused due to the habit Uh, the treatment of habit break of thumb sucking habit can be either with chemical means or mechanical means chemical means you could put some bitter bitter uh, uh, chemical substance on the surface of uh, the child's uh, um, thumb or the finger which the child is putting in his mouth or it could be a mechanical device like a thumb sucking habit breaking appliance which could be either fixed or removable the next the next habit is the tongue thrust habit breaking appliance now tongue thrusting habit breaking appliance is just a a continuation or you could say of a um, of a habit which is generally uh, considered to be normal when the child is just born now we all know that when a child is born the maxillary arch is a little well developed as compared to the mandibular arch or so some sort of open bite generally remains or some sort of space remains between the maxillary arch and the and the mandibular arch but in order to create some sort of seal because the child has to swallow the milk the child generally thrusts the tongue in between the space to create an oral seal this habit of thrusting if it continues even when the teeth has erupted leads to the tongue thrust habit now tongue thrust habit can be of two different types it could be a simple tongue thrust where the child is thrusting the mandible the tongue only in the anterior direction or it could be complex now simple tongue thrust could be diagnosed with an open bite seen only in the anterior region whereas in case of complex tongue thrust you would see the open bite even in the posterior region now the diagnosis can generally be done on the basis of lip separation the patient will definitely have some sort of speech problem the patient will find it difficult to uh, to say a few words the consonant words definitely there will be increased uh, facial height and sometimes you also have you will see a large tongue what happens because of the tongue thrust habit you will see proclination of the maxillary incisors you will see increased overjet you will see maxillary constriction and generalized spacing also in the dental arch the third had third habit that you need to know about is the mouth breathing habit it is the habitual respiration through the mouth instead of the nose now the etiology of mouth breathing habit could be anatomic where the problem is lying in the anatomic structure of the nose it could be obstructive because of presence of such some adenoids or inflammatory conditions because of which the child is not able to breathe through the nose or it could be habitual the child has just got habituated breathing through the mouth how would we diagnose it now generally it is said that a mouth breathing habit patient generally has a adenoid type of face which would include a long narrow face a short upper lip an expressionless face a high palatal vault we could also do the diagnosis with the help of three tests that is the water test the cotton test and the mirror test now the water test means that you ask the patient take a sip of water and ask to fill his mouth with water and ask the patient to close the mouth and remain for a couple of seconds if the patient is a mouth breather the child need to spit out the second test is the cotton test uh the second test is the cotton test where uh, the cotton uh, some strands of cotton are generally placed on just near your uh, no nostrils and if the cotton flutters then it would mean that the child is a cotton uh, is a mouth breather the third test is the mirror test where you generally place the mirror just below the nostril and if the mirror fogs then it means that the patient is a uh, no is a nasal breather 
Now the sequelae of mouth breathing habit is maxillary anterior proclination. You generally have increased risk of caries. You will de you will you will cause the child is continuously keeping the mouth open, so you generally results in a dry mouth. The other habits that you also need to think about is bruxism, which means the habitual grinding of the teeth. It may cause occlusal uh, deformities and it may cause uh, reduction in the bite of the patient. Lip biting habit where the child is uh, biting his lip because of which you may it may result in uh, the retro inclination of the lower incisors and the proclination of the upper incisors can be corrected with a lip biting habit picking up lines. And of course, a nail bite, and again, a nail biting habit, again, which needs to be corrected because it can cause deleterious effect on our dentition. Coming to diagnosis and treatment planning. Now, what we have the history, clinical exam, uh, we analyze this, made, we classify the problem list before we come to a diagnosis. If we have simple thing, we come along list in orthodontics according to our prior order ABCD. We find out a solution to the individual problems ABCD, formulate an optimum thing. Now, we, now the diagnostic aids that are used for diagnosis are the essential diagnostic aids and the supplementary diagnostic aids. Now the essential diagnostic aids it mainly consists of case history, clinical examination, study models, certain radiographs like OPG and lateral cephalograms, and the patient photographs. Supplementary diagnostic aids are aids which, in addition to the essential, we may require only in some cases. For example, uh, occlusive view of the maxilla or the mandible in case of impacted canines. We may require an electromyographic examination of the muscle activity. We may require a CT scan, an MRI, endocrine test, and so forth and so forth. Now the clinical examination, uh, in when we are doing uh, the clinical examination in orthodontics, uh, we do the clinical examination, general, general that is the physical clinical examination, the external examination and the intraoral examination. We definitely find the height and weight and the gait of the patient because we want to know that the patient is healthy or not. Uh, the posture is very important and the gait is very important. It is very important for us to understand the body language of the patient. If the body language is positive, if the patient is walking straight and is, uh, has a confident posture, that means the patient is going to be a good patient. The patient has come on his own. So it is easier for us to explain our treatment plan and get cooperation from the patient. The other thing that we see is the body build. In external examination, we see the head shape, facial form, facial symmetry, Proportion, divergence. We're going to be covering this in the next slides. And intraoral uh, examination, we see the tongue, palate, gingiva, female attachment, and functional examination. As I was telling you, in general examination, we see the body build of the patient because uh, if you, because sometimes the body build will also give us some idea about the shape of the dental arch. For example, the body build can be divided into three different types: the aesthetic, which stands for thin. And generally, we see a narrow dental arch. Plethoric patients are generally obese patients, and we see a large or a square dental arch. And athletic patients, uh, where we have a normal bit of the patient, and we generally see a normal-sized dental arch. Now, another question that is commonly asked in exams is the Sheldon's body type. Now, the Sheldon's body type is, typical, is again, trying to tell you your body weight or the physique of the patient. Ectomorphic, standing for aesthetic or a thin patient. Mesomorphic standing for athletic or a normal patient and endomorphic which stands uh, for a plethoric or an obese type of patients. Coming to the extraoral examination, what we check is the facial form of the patient. Uh, again, the facial form is divided into three types, the brachyfacial, the mesofacial and the dolicofacial. But the brachyfacial types are the short and wide face. Mesofacial are the average face and oligofacial are the long and narrow face. Now, why is this important? Because brachyfacial patients may have a large and a wide and large may not require expansion. Whereas in oligofacial type, the patient may have uh, a long face, the patient may have contracted upper arch and because of which expansion should be considered as a part of our orthodontic treatment. Coming to the shape of the head, again, uh, the shape of the head can be divided into three parts depending upon the ratio of the length to the breadth of the uh, head. Mesocephalic, 
means the average shape of the head and generally what we see is the normal dental arch dolichocephalic when you have the length more than the width and generally you see a narrow dental arch and brachycephalic when the width is more than the length and and generally clinically you will be able to see a broad dental arch coming to again another aspect of the extra oral examination is a facial profile we have three different profiles that we look into the straight profile the convex profile and the concave profile as i was mentioning in the ackerman profit classification also as these profiles are also indicative of maybe what type of skeletal malocclusion we are looking at with the straight profile trying to tell us that the patient is a class one skeletal profile a convex profile trying to tell us that the patient might be a skeletal class 2 profile a skeletal class 2 malocclusion whereas a concave profile would be telling me about a skeletal class 3 malocclusion next we check the facial symmetry now we see the facial symmetry both in the vertical plane as well as in the horizontal plane now what do we do when we do the vertical plane we draw four lines the first line is passing to the head la- hairline the second line is passing to the eyebrow the third line at the base of the nose and the fourth line at the chin level now these four lines are basically trying to divide our face into four three different parts now if we need a good vertical symmetry then each of the part should be equal that means the each part should be 1/3 1/3 in millimeter or it could be 1/3 of the size now the lower part of the face if we divide it by again drawing a line at the commissure of the tongue uh, commissure of the lips then the upper part should be 1/3 and the lower part should be 2/3 If we try to do the facial symmetry again in a horizontal plane, what we do is we draw a straight line passing to the uh, center of the nose, and then we draw two lines on either side of the face, one passing to the inner canthus of the eye, and the other passing to the external canthus of the eye. And the distance between the inner canthus of the eye to the middle line and the outer canthus of the eye to the middle line should be the same on both the left as well as the side, right side of the face. for us to have a good facial symmetry now students remember there is uh, the the fact that there is a good facial symmetry itself is a misnomer it is very it is very difficult for you to find any individual with a good facial symmetry and a optimum facial symmetry some sort of asymmetry always remains in every patient so again this facial symmetry should be taken with a pinch of salt coming to intraoral examination we are going to be checking for frenal attachment because Uh, in case we have a low frenal attachment that may be the reason for our um, midline diastema and as madam said ki uh, our uh, treatment plan of midline diastema is going to be changed uh, the gingiva and the periodontal ligament also plays a very important role when you're doing our treatment plan because we need to strengthen our gingiva and our uh, periodontium if, if it is not very uh, we also check the tongue the lips the palate the as a the teeth the shape of the spit that there is a presence of any supernumerary teeth all this will affect our treatment plan and hence we need to check